Hello, good evening and welcome to another program on law and order. Now, as humans, every human knows that there is some right that we have, when we, whether we live in Sri Lanka or whether we live in another country. These rights might change depending on the country you live, but we do have some inherited rights called human rights. Uh, the legality of human rights came into being by a document called Magna Carta about 800 years ago in UK. That is the first time human rights were recognized. But since then, up to now, how has it developed? What are the human rights we have now? Is it the same as the fundamental rights or is it different? Sometimes we tend to mix these two. Tonight, we are going to tackle and go to the root of the matter and find out what exactly are human rights that we are entitled to as citizens of Sri Lanka and how we can go about protecting them and what we can do when they are violated and questions and issues revolving around that. For this, I have invited once again to the studio uh, an expert on this, Ambika Satgurunathan. She is a commissioner of the Human Rights Commission of Sri Lanka and a qualified attorney in this area. Ambika, thank you very much for coming back for the show. And uh, mm -hmm. we had a lovely discussion last time about uh, women's rights mm -hmm. and lots of areas you and I didn't disagree. Hopefully, we'll <laughs> agree in human rights. <laughs> right. Like I said in my introduction, what is a human right? Or is it started only with the Magna Carta or is it goes beyond that? Uh, okay. What are human rights? Um, human rights are rights that are inherent to each one of us. And if you look at, uh, you know, the modern era, we can, uh, I think, uh, um, for instance, uh, you know, people like Justice Veeramantri have actually looked at the different religions and cultures and tried to trace back the notion of rights, uh, as you said, um, uh, in the past. But uh, if we look at the, the, the modern era, we have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that, uh, you know, post-World War II, came into being, right. uh, which is now understood to be customary international law. So right. customary international law means that it has been practiced and accepted by all the nations so that, you know, it becomes custom and everyone accepts it. Uh, so the UDHR, as we call it, in, uh, includes all these rights. Some of those rights have then been be internationally, we have come up with the uh, special conventions, what are called conventions right. on specific rights. So we have the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Mm -hmm. We have another one on elimination of all forms of discrimination against uh, women. Mm -hmm. We have the Convention on the Rights of the Child. We have on um, economic, social and cultural rights. So those are international conventions. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that countries can sign up to them and ratify them. By doing that, what you are agreeing mm -hmm. to is you're agreeing to accept all the rights that are included in that mm -hmm. convention. Right. So Sri Lanka, for instance, has a great ratification record. Right. We have ratified pretty much nearly <laughs> all the yeah. international yeah. Uh, conventions yeah. and treaties. So if we look at, if we move from the international to the national sphere and we look at Sri Lanka, we have the constitution. Mm -hmm. And in the constitution, we have the fundamental rights chapter. Now, certain rights are included in the fundamental rights chapter, but not all rights. So, for instance, we have the right to equality, the uh, right not to be discriminated against, then we have freedom from torture, freedom of expression, association, assembly is also protected, uh, freedom against or right not to be arbitrarily arrested, that is protected, freedom of movement. So, certain rights are included in the fundamental rights chapter of our constitution. Right. So these are rights that are inherent to both you and me, to all of us. All of us. Yes. Right. You said that we have basically as a good track record of uh, signing into all these charters. Mm -hmm. But as you know, you have to make domestic law That's of right. that to be applicable. That's have right. we made sufficient domestic law for these human rights to take effect in Sri Lanka? Uh, well, I think uh, we, we, we well we need to mm. uh, because even if we take, for instance, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, mm. we do have the ICCPR mm. Act, mm. but that act only includes certain rights that are in the ICCPR. Mm. Um, recently, we, we've uh, ratified about a year, I think, ago, a year or a year and a half ago, we ratified the Convention on the Protection of All Persons from Enforced Disappearances. Mm. And about two weeks ago, Parliament passed a law to uh, enabling legislation mm. to bring that into 
domestic law. Right. So I think we have done that to a certain extent, but our track record actually, I mean, we could improve uh, on that. Mm -hmm. on uh, passing enabling legislation. That enabling legislation which was passed in two years ago, are you satisfied with that local act? Uh, which one? The which you just mentioned. The, the, um, two weeks ago, yes, yes. the enforced disappearances. Yes, yes. That actually when it was in bill form, it right. was in draft form, yeah. the Human Rights Commission uh, made a number of recommendations right. to uh, strengthen that strengthen and that. to bring that in line with the international convention. Yeah. Now, since it's been passed, I haven't had time to review it to actually ascertain whether all our recommendations have been incorporated or not. Yeah, because one of the uh, one of the key um, mistakes we find as a conventional attorney, I also find mm. in 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 going into certain access, we don't follow the totality of the no, spirit of the don't. model law. Exactly, so the spirit. Yes. That is the important yes. thing. Great we, that we, we have that, that. Uh, issue in arbitration law and I was uh, finding it recently. Anyway, so uh, you are a commissioner of the Human Rights Commission. Yes. Just tell us what is your mandate? Where, when can an uh, ordinary citizen like me or anyone who is watching us can come to you for what can we come to you? Okay. What is the mandate of Human Rights Commission? Right. So the Human Rights Commission was established by an Act of Parliament, Act Number 21 of 1996. Uh, and thereafter, um, after the uh, 19th Amendment was passed in 2015, mm -hmm. Uh, the Constitutional Council was established via the 19th mm -hmm. Amendment to the Constitution and then the co all appointments to the commissions uh, was thereafter, um, uh, uh, thereafter are made by the Constitutional Council. Mm -hmm. So this makes the commissions mm -hmm. independent. So we have the Human Rights Commission, Public Service Commission, the um, Bribery Commission, mm -hmm. Uh, the police national police commission so we have many independent commissions mm -hmm. now the human rights commission we are independent and we report to parliament mm -hmm. so we don't come under any specific ministry or you know etc uh, the mandate of the commission is to accept complaints of allegations of violations of fundamental rights so if anyone feels that their fundamental right has been violated then they can come in complain to us. We are also mandated to advise the government mm. on law reform, right. on changing national laws to ensure that they are in line with international human rights laws and standards. We are also mandated to engage in public education, right. awareness raising on human rights. Mm. We can also visit places of detention where any person is deprived of mm liberty. We can also summon witnesses, we can summon documentation. So that those are our powers uh, and um, our mandate broadly speaking. Right. Now you said uh, anybody can complain of a violation or, or, or something of they feel a violation. Alleged violation. Or alleged yes. violation of a fundamental right. That's is right. this limited to the fundamental rights enshrined in the constitution or is your mandate broader? Yes, good question. Uh, yeah. Well, um, it certainly includes all the rights included in the, um, uh, the fundamental rights chapter, but even in other instances, there could be instances where it could be brought under the equality provision. Mm. So the Human Rights Commission, while you know, we, uh, we also believe that uh, it is important for Sri Lanka to abide by its international human rights obligations. Mm. So if we find that there is a certain right that has not been included, that is still violated, that is not protected, we actually would not ignore it. Mm. We would actually take that up and would, we would make recommendations uh, for the alleged violation for the remedy to be given. If there is law reform that has to be done by the government, we would then advocate for that. Mm. So we do take a, a, a broad perspective where rights are concerned. Right. Uh, the fundamental rights chapter, uh, where uh, the constitution enshrines certain fundamental rights, are you happy with these fundamental rights as something that has uh, encompassed all human rights that people uh, do need to exercise or have, or is there a lot of room for improvement? So, uh, for instance, um, the government started a constitutional reform process, yeah. and they set up this uh, the public representation. I mean, committee that went around the country and obtained views from uh, the public. Mm. So, and they also set up the constitutional assembly and the different thematic subcommittees. So, the Human Rights Commission, we went before the Public Representations Committee. We made representations. We also made representations to the the subcommittee on 
fundamental rights. Mm -hmm. And what we said in our recommendations is that the fundamental rights chapter or what we call the Bill of Rights mm -hmm. should be made broader. Mm -hmm. So for instance, the grounds of non-discrimination we said should be made broader. So you need to have like, uh, you know, right to privacy, the right not to be discriminated based on your uh, sexual orientation and, um, uh, 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 sorry, uh, 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 sexual, yeah, um, sexual orientation. And so we actually advocated for the Bill of Rights, particularly the non-discrimination chapter, to be broadened, mm. to uh, give uh, uh, better protection mm. for groups that are currently uh, marginalized. Right. Those are the only areas. You, 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 you all don't see things like which are enshrined in Indian constitution like the right to life. Of you, course we did. Of course. Did. That is a given. Of course. Right to life. Yes, Do we have right to clearly. education here? Uh, no, we no. don't. Yeah, but no, India we does. don't. And uh, yes. And also, I mean, what we have also been, the commission has been advocating is for uh, socioeconomic rights to be also included. Okay. To, now, yeah. Okay. Now Go the ahead. question is, now people can come and they will complain to you. Mm. What is the difference of their complaining to you? Uh, fu violation of one of those fundamental rights and going to court straight away. Right. Going to Supreme Court straight away. Good question. Uh, because as you said, rightly said, if there is a violation of a fundamental rights, you can actually file a petition in mm. the Supreme Court. Yeah. The Human Rights Commission has been set up as an alternate mechanism mm. because going to court would be expensive. You would need to retain a lawyer and it might also be a very time consuming and cumbersome process. So the Human Rights Commission is supposed to be an alternative mechanism mm. because when you come to us, it is free. You do not need a lawyer mm. and it is supposed to be quicker. Mm. Of course, we have to be honest and say what we have found that is even our processes are there are long delays mm. and that has been due to many reasons we have, which we have tried to rectify since we were appointed mm. uh, in 2015. We find that, you know, uh, there are cases that have been delayed for years. Sometimes we mm. get appeal letters from the uh, complainants. Um, so uh, the, the difference is that also the so, um, you know, you don't need a lawyer. It is supposed to be much easier for you. You will get assistance in filing a complaint if, if you do not for instance, know what sort of uh, supporting documents you have to provide. We will actually provide the advice. And if we find that the complaint does not fall within our mandate, then we would refer you to the relevant body and give right. advice. Right. right. Now, um, what if a person has a grievance, mm -hmm. which is not one of those fundamental rights, right? Are you taking the such complaint and are you able to process that through or not? Yes. Now, for instance, if a, uh, if a person says that the person is differently abled, yes. right, uh, and the, uh, the person has been discriminated against due to that disability, mm -hmm. now you can argue that is not enshrined as a ground of non-discrimination yeah. in Article yeah. you know, 12. Mm -hmm. But we would still accept that because we believe that A, Sri Lanka has ratified the International Convention on the Protection of uh, Persons with Disabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and therefore, we need to also... Uh, um, uh, respect our international obligations yes. and also it violates equality yes. it yes. violates you know article 12 one yeah. so therefore yes we would most definitely uh, uh, accept that complaint because we feel believe that certain groups like persons with disabilities are discriminated against and are marginalized okay what are the areas because a lot of people who are watching would want to know because some some other areas even I have found people who, who come, you can't go to Supreme Court on mm. that. It's not one of the recognized fundamental mm. rights. So what are the areas of at least the uh, uh, conventions we have ratified at Sri Lanka, like like what you mentioned now, which, uh, which rights are not enshrined in the uh, constitution as fundamental rights, but you can go into looking into what are those those areas can you just just rem remember uh well what are those areas i mean persons with disabilities would be one yeah. uh, but any also groups that are being marginalized so even if that is when not groups marginalized what so for mean? instance i mean we have migrant workers, migrant workers. who are being discriminated against uh, we have uh, lgbtiq persons right. Who are discriminated against we have groups like plantation workers um, uh, so we there are different various groups whose rights are discriminated and you, you might say well you know um, the particular right is not 
not uh, uh, included in right. the fundamental rights chapter. Yeah. But we would still, as I said, take a broad view because discrimination right. is discrimination, discrimination falls under Article 12. Uh, so basically, what you're saying is if we file any area which we feel a discrimination. But it's, it has to be by state. I mean, we cannot take complaints against private entities. So right. the corporate sector, we can't. Right. If it's a private dispute like land dispute, right. we can't. It has to be against a state entity that has violated any one of the rights. So, you know, it could, okay. yeah. Equality, or so it could be So basically, anything that you can file against the state, you feel that your right is violated. We can, you can come to you all, and then you all look into it along with the documents which Sri Lanka has ratified, and then uh, see whether there's a case. But you brought a very interesting point in saying it's not against the private sector. But as you know, in the private sector, also tremendous amount, especially disability uh, mm. right, discrimination on disabilities and all that things are mm. happening. So, in Sri Lanka, you don't have such a mandate. But anywhere in the world, is there any country? But there have been recommendations made as part of the, the constitutional reform process okay. to also make the Bill of Rights actually applicable to the private sector as well. Right. Because you would have to change in any, that. Any, any other country? Uh, well, in other countries, you have legislation where you can actually, for discrimination by private actors, you right. can file action. Right. But then sometimes in some countries, filing action also means that you need to have the legal means to do so. Yeah, exactly. Right. So in Sri Lanka, for instance, even if you have specific laws that, you know, to take, to file private suit, for instance, you, we have very little access to legal aid. Uh -huh. In Sri Lanka, Legal Aid, I mean, you have the Legal Aid Commission, yes, which yeah. provides Legal Aid for certain kinds of uh, mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. uh, but private, you know, kind of Legal Aid clinics, etc., very few in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. So for a private citizen to file action mm -hmm. in court would be something that would be tremendously, I think, financially, the burden, it burdensome. Right. Yeah. Uh, so what can you do to improve that? Well, once, I mean, legal aid is a very important thing. I mean, that's also one of an important right which we have actually recommended be included in the, you know, in our recommendations on constitutional reform Reforms, we have. Right. Uh, that is actually something I think that the state has to provide, but also we need to bring about that culture because culture. once again, the legal fraternity, because if you look at other countries, yes. they have the bar associations provide, have a very robust kind of, uh, you know, setup where they provide. You have legal aid clinics where lawyers volunteer a lot of their time yeah, I, I, you I, have I, law firms Correct. correct they do pro bono work. lot of pro bono work mm -hmm. they do for this kind so that i think so where, the, where you you mean to say when you have that kind of a professional law firms and associations of lawyers and government stepping in and putting a lot of resources for legal aid uh, what happens i i know for example in england is that uh, when a person who doesn't have money comes to legal aid the, there is resources to retain the best lawyer for that and get the basic justice. Exactly. And this sort of thing is exactly not so that is that is severely lacking in yeah. Sri Lanka. Uh -huh. So that is something but you all have suggested the, that the, the legal yeah. fraternity needs to, to in a sense, uh, yeah, they need to um, uh, provide and uh, expend resources and time to create that culture of pro bono work because one of the reasons because lack of access to legal aid also impacts on for instance even let's say prison overcrowding uh -huh. because in sri lanka yeah. we find that a large population of our prison i'm um, a large percentage of our prison population happen to be remandees now many of these remandees they are remanded they have no they action pay some money yes. they can't pay their bail yes some of them don't have access to lawyers so yes. they don't even know what happens in court exactly right and you might find even uh, by the death penalties mm. is concerned it might be that a person gets on death row because um, the person didn't have access to good uh, legal aid. Now, this you have found in other countries. Now, for instance, in the US, particularly in the past 12 months, many people who have been on death row have been released because it is found that at the time they didn't have access to good legal counsel and there was evidence that actually exonerates them. Mm -hmm. So even three months ago, I found a man was released after 23 years, I think. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is why legal aid is so important because it impacts on other aspects like for instance as i said the human rights and prison system as well prison system as well yes okay you you brought into a very um, you mentioned a very important question about our position about this uh, death penalty yes now there's a lot of arguments in different countries whether yes. death penalty should be there should not be there as far as looking at human rights rights of human are concerned uh, does the state have the right to kill the license to kill they do get the license to kill certain states, certain countries when it is legislated. But 
does the state has a license to kill? I'll, I'll, I'll couple this with a, mm -hmm. with a statement that uh, uh, one of the Republican, uh, Texan uh, Republican uh, senators was saying. He said that our rights does not come from the Constitution, our rights come from God. Therefore, you don't have a right to kill. These are certain states in the U.S. Mm -hmm. who are opposing yes. um, the death penalty. Ab what is your opinion on this? Uh, the opinion of the commission is yes. that on the 1st of January 2016, yes, 2016, we wrote to the, His Excellency the President. Mm. And we actually called upon His Excellency to abolish the death penalty uh -huh. in Sri Lanka. Uh -huh. And we called for Sri Lanka to ratify the second optional protocol to the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights. Right. Because the second optional protocol is about the abolition of the death penalty. Mm -hmm. And the reasons we gave are mm -hmm. that now the arguments for the death penalty is that it acts as a deterrent. Yes. You find there's been d research done in many other contexts which show that it doesn't actually act mm -hmm. as a deterrent. And often you find it is the poor people who end up on death row right. because as I said they don't have access to yeah. good legal counsel. And, um, and also death penalty being on the death penalty and being on death row for a long time can, is also now thought to be a cr cruel and unusual punishment mm. it's you know um, yeah. understood to be uh, torture, torture yeah. so for all these reasons mm. we actually called for the abolition of the death penalty and also there could be mistakes made in the uh, justice process, system exactly. process yes. right so the wrong person could actually be also sentenced yes. and when, once a life is lost you can't gain it yes. back but Conversely, mm -hmm. people, uh, if you could remember the rape case in India, the gang rape case. Of, Vidya. Uh, uh, Vidya. Yes. Uh, people were calling mm. that death penalty should be brought not only for murder, mm. but also for situations like um, uh, rape. And I, I have uh, female attorneys in Sri Lanka mm -hmm. who, are, who are saying who should, this should be done. What do, you, what do you think of that? Well, I mean, in India, even since then, I mean, we've had the Vidya case. They brought about a commission. They brought about, you know, various um, uh, reform processes after that. Even now, we still see uh, uh, more reporting, perhaps, of violence against women mm. and uh, girl children. And that's what I said, being, bringing about the death penalty really will not have an impact because it's about the mindset. And it's about impunity, mm. right? Because if you think you can get away with it, you will do it. Mm. And you find and that sense of impunity is deeply embedded in people's minds because you find in many cases, for instance, uh, uh, um, a per the perpetrator lives right next to the victim. Mm. He rapes the victim and then leaves the victim and goes off. So I always wonder, how do they think they're not going to get caught? Mm. Because that sense of impunity mm. and also the sense of male entitlement, mm. where you we view women as objects, mm. right? Where you can perpetrate any violence because they don't have value in society. Therefore, you can get away scot-free. So those are the things we need to tackle. Even if you bring about the death penalty, if a man still sees a woman as some sort of an object on which violence can be perpetrated, freely mm. is that going to help right so the alternative you gave for abolishing death penalty is life imprisonment yes you yes. can have life imprisonment and also in some cases that might be you know the perpetrators might also have various psychological disorders mm. actually when they those who cr uh, commit very violent crimes you find that can be sociopathic they can be psychopathic etc so those things also need to be looked into right and because as Gunadan, thank you very much for that uh, discussion uh, in the broadest based uh, on human rights. Is there any last words you want to leave to our viewers? Um, I think the most important thing I think for protection of human rights is for each citizen yes. to have a sense of civic responsibility mm -hmm. and always keep in mind that you must care when someone else's right is being violated because that undermines generally respect for the rule of law in a country and it can ultimately also impact you adversely. Thank you very much once again for joining Law and Order. Thank you. So our discussion today on Law and Order was human rights in a very broad uh, basis and my guest today was Ampika Satgunanathan, uh, Commissioner of Human Rights Commission of Sri Lanka and a specialist in that area of law. We'll join you next week at the same time for another program on Law and Order. If you miss our programs, go to our website channelai.lk, pick Law and Order from the drop down menu and you can watch our shows all over again. Have a good weekend and good night.
Thank you.